there, welcome back to another Make Science Easy Physics lesson. In this lesson, we're going to be learning all about speed time graphs. So this lesson follows on directly from the previous lesson about distance time graphs. So let's have a quick recap of what we already know from last lesson. A speed time graph is a graph that compares speed of an object against the time that it's been traveling. The time always goes along the x-axis and the speed always goes along the y-axis. Now speed time graphs look almost identical to distance time graphs. The only real difference is that you're going to see speed written on the y-axis and not distance. So whenever you get a graph showing motion of an object, check the y-axis. Have a look and see if it's saying speed or distance. And it is incredibly important that you double check this because if you don't, you are going to interpret it incorrectly. If you interpret a speed time graph in the same way as you interpret a distance time graph, you will make mistakes. So let's have a look at constant speed for a speed time graph. So on a speed time graph, constant speed is represented by a horizontal line. So here we can see constant speed of 40 meters per second. Because the speed is not going up or down, the line is horizontal for 40 meters per second all the time. The higher the line is along the y-axis, the greater the speed. The lower the line is along the y-axis, the lower the speed. So if you confuse the speed time graph for a distance time graph, you're going to incorrectly conclude that the horizontal line is showing something that is stationary. This is why it is so important that we double check the type of graph that we have. Okay, and the next thing is constant acceleration. Now, constant acceleration means that the rate of acceleration stays the same at all times. So the rate of acceleration does not change over time when it is constant. And constant acceleration on a speed time graph is shown by a straight diagonal line. The steeper the diagonal line, the greater the rate of acceleration. The shallower the diagonal line, the lower the rate of acceleration. So we can see that acceleration is happening because the speed is constantly increasing and the speed increases by the same amount every single second, so the rate is constant. Again, if you confuse your speed time graph with a distance time graph, you're going to incorrectly conclude that the straight diagonal line is showing you a constant speed. Again, you must double check which type of graph you are interpreting. Okay, so let's have a look at how we can calculate constant acceleration on a speed time graph. Now we know that the rate of acceleration can be calculated using the equation, acceleration is equal to change of speed divided by time, or A equals V minus U divided by T. Either version of the equation is fine, it means the same thing. So we have our three lines here, we're gonna call them A, B and C for simplicity. And we're gonna calculate the rate of acceleration in each one. So let's start with line A and we draw a triangle because we want to find out the time and the change of speed. Now just like last lesson when we're drawing triangles and graphs in order to find out values for x axes and y axes we draw these triangles as big as possible. It reduces the amount of error. So we can see acceleration for line A is 60 meters per second divided by 15 seconds, which gives us a rate of acceleration of four meters per second squared. We can then have a look at line B. So we draw our triangle again. Time is 30 seconds. Change in speed is 60 meters per second. So acceleration for line B is 60 meters per second divided by 30 seconds, which gives us a rate of acceleration of two meters per second squared. Finally, we're going to have a look at line C. Time is 30 seconds. 
change of speed is 10 meters per second. So acceleration is equal to 10 meters per second divided by 30 seconds, which gives us 0 0.33 meters per second squared. Remember, you're looking to have your units to two decimal places and make sure that your rounding is done correctly. If you're not sure how to do this, check out the scientific literacy lessons, which are completely free. I just want to take a little break in this lesson to tell you a little bit more about Make Science Easy. And you can visit us at makescienceeasy.com. At our website, makescienceeasy.com, we have complete science courses for biology, chemistry, and physics. These are just like this lesson, but in lots more detail, covering everything that you need to know to pass your science exams. Every course, so the biology, the chemistry, and the physics, has over 65 lessons to it. Every lesson also includes printable resources, question and answer sheets to make sure you've understood, and multiple choice quizzes that you can take online and you get an immediate grade to see how much you've understood and if you've really learned the concepts. If you want to sign up for Make Science Easy and get access to all these lessons, there is a free trial, but at the checkout, if you want to purchase full access, you can save 50% by entering the code YT50. Okay, so we can also have a look at negative constant acceleration. So constant negative acceleration is acceleration. Remember, we don't use the term deceleration, but instead of the speed increasing, it is decreasing. And it is shown just like before by a straight diagonal line, but this time the line is going downwards. Again, just like before, the steeper the diagonal line, the greater the rate of negative acceleration, whereas the shallower the diagonal line, the lower the rate of negative acceleration. So the rate of acceleration is calculated in exactly the same way as we would do for positive acceleration. So because this is calculated the same way, we can see our triangle, we can see that we have minus 60 meters per second is our change of speed and we can see our time is 30 seconds so using our equation acceleration is equal to change in speed divided by time we can see that acceleration is equal to minus 60 meters per second divided by 30 seconds so acceleration is equal to minus 2 meters per second squared so it's done in exactly the same way as before just with a negative number for change in speed because speed is decreasing, not increasing. Now, non-constant acceleration is a little bit different. So when we have non-constant rate of acceleration, the rate of acceleration is not constant, it is changing. So non-constant rates of acceleration are shown by curved lines. So a curved line on a speed time graph tells you you have acceleration and it is not a constant rate of acceleration. So this pattern is definitely the closest to a distance time graph. So the steeper the gradient of the line, the greater the rate of the acceleration is. The shallower the gradient, again, the lower the rate of acceleration. When the gradient of the line changes, so does the rate of acceleration. So anytime we see a change to the gradient of that line, you see a change to the rate of acceleration. So this pattern is really, really similar to what we see for a distance time graph. The rate of acceleration at a specific time can be calculated in exactly the same way that we calculated acceleration for our distance time graph. We draw a tangent to the line. So if I want to calculate the rate of acceleration at 10 seconds, I draw a tangent to the line at 10 seconds. And I want to make that tangent as large as possible, so I have a triangle as large as I possibly can. So the larger the tangent, the greater the rate of accuracy. I create my triangle and I read the value. So the value of time, the change in time is 20 seconds and the change in speed is 55 meters per second. So, Acceleration is equal to change in speed divided by time. So acceleration at 10 seconds and only at 10 seconds is equal to 55 meters per second 
divided by 20 seconds, which gives me 2.75 meters per second squared. So it's important to note that the rate of acceleration is only valid for where you've drawn your tangent. Because the rate of acceleration is changing, the angle of the tangent will also change at different points of the graph. We can illustrate that by measuring the rate of acceleration at 15 seconds. We do exactly the same thing we did before. We draw our tangent, we create our triangle, and we measure the time and the change to speed. So here the time is 25 seconds. The change of speed is 45 meters per second. Acceleration is equal to change in speed divided by time. So acceleration is equal to 45 meters per second divided by 25 seconds. So my rate of acceleration is 1.8 meters per second squared. So we can see the rate of acceleration at 15 seconds is different to the rate of acceleration at 10 seconds. The gradient of the line is different at these times as well. Now, one of the most important things we can do from a speed time graph is we can calculate the distance that an object travels. Now, we know that distance is equal to speed times time. Now, this equation is not helpful when speed changes over time because you end up having to do 20 different equations and it becomes quite troublesome and you actually end up making some silly errors. But we can work out distance traveled on a speed time graph much more easily by calculating the total area under the line of the graph. So in this particular example, it's very, very simple. We just have a triangle. So the area of a triangle is half times the base times the height. So the base of this triangle is 30. The height of this triangle is 60 meters per second. So the distance is equal to half times 30 seconds times 60 meters per second, which is going to give us a distance of 900 meters. So by calculating the area under the graph, we've calculated that this object has traveled 900 meters in this graph. But of course, it's not always that simple. We often get graphs with slightly more complicated shapes. So when we have a graph that doesn't have a simple shape, we need to do something slightly different. And what we need to do is we need to break our graph into different parts. So here, I've broken my graph into three different triangles and one rectangle. Now what we do is we can now calculate the area of each of these shapes. We can then add them together and we can work out the total distance shown by this graph. The total distance under the line of the graph. So I've got my measurements here of base and height for different things. So the first triangle, we can see the base is 10 seconds, the height is 40 meters per second. So distance equals half times 10 times 40, which gives us 200 meters. The second part is going to be our rectangle. So rectangles, the area is base times height. So the base is 15 seconds. The height is 40 meters per second. 15 times 40 is 600 meters. Our third triangle, the distance is half times 10 seconds, our base, times 10 meters per second, our height, which gives us 50 meters. And our final triangle, we have a base of five and a height of 50, so half times five times 50, gives us an area of 125 meters. We add these all together to work out our total distance. 200 plus 600 plus 50 plus 125 meters gives us a distance traveled for this graph of 975 meters. So in summary, Motion can be shown by speed time graphs or distance time graphs. Always check the y-axis to see which type of graph you have. On a speed time graph, 
A straight upwards diagonal line always shows constant acceleration. A straight downwards diagonal line always shows constant negative acceleration. A horizontal line shows constant speed and a curved line shows a changing rate of acceleration. Acceleration can be calculated with the equation acceleration equals change in speed times time. And if acceleration is not constant, you need to draw a tangent to the curve to calculate the acceleration for a specific time. And finally, the area under a line of a speed time graph shows us how far an object has traveled. So I hope you now know the difference between a speed time graph and a distance time graph. I hope you can recognize the different parts of a speed time graph and I hope you can calculate different things from these graphs including acceleration and how far an object has traveled. Until next lesson, keep on learning.